Hello. So this is a video with uh, a conversation between me and uh, John Holland, my dearest friend John. Uh, I recorded, of course, with this uh, consensus, uh, this uh, audio recording in March 2017. And um, I'm, I want to share this one because, you know, this is like a story, you know, some questions that I asked to, to John, uh, my dear friend John here, and, you know, you can see John in his lab with me, it's a photo we took together. And, uh, and uh, this is the conversation. So, I remember once you told me, you know, that when you, when did you start, when did you start working on exercise? You know, how, which year it was when you started? It was in the 60s? Yes, 1963. 63. And, you know, I remember, if I remember well, once you told me that basically back 62. That, that Nobody, you know, all the physicians, all the scientists, they, they thought, you know, exercise, science was nonsense. Right. Back then, a lot of people still thought that exercise was bad for you. Uh, yes. So, it, not that it was good, it was bad. Yeah. That's what in, the, the physicians were thinking. Some. A lot of people believed in the rate of living theory. Uh huh. So, exercise increases the rate of living. But there were some scientists or physicians that were suggesting people to exercise or none? No. None. Well, I don't know about none, but, but the emphasis was in the opposite direction because of the rate of living theory. You should exercise as less as possible. Yeah, limit your exercise. Okay. And if I remember well, you know, I don't, I don't know if, if, if I got it wrong, you told me, you know, that in those years, in the 60s, you, you or someone else was jogging and the police stopped you and they were asking, you know, why you were jogging. Am I right or I, I got it wrong? It probably happened, but it wasn't. It, it, wasn't, you, it wasn't you. No, it wasn't you. So I, 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 I misunderstood. And so basically, how, how did you started to be interested in exercise. Why? I forgot, you know, you told me something about the, 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 the frogs, the, the, you know, the contraction of the frogs. I don't remember how it came. Here you can recognize the long pause before John was answering the questions. Back, back in the early 60s. It's then you thought that you shouldn't exercise vigorously. And a lot of chronic heart disease and uh, obesity, diabetes. And uh, until about I guess the late 19th century, you know, people had to exercise. It was work more than exercise. It was work more than exercise. It was not sport. If you want to go anywhere, you yeah. ride a horse or walk. Right. Yeah. And, and people have to walk everywhere. I mean, it's yeah. in all physical. Many work had to be done to say, yeah. yeah, to find food, you know, to, to yeah. get the food in the, in, the, in the wild or whatever. So when you look at, at that time, there were still some primitive societies. There aren't any more. But back in 1960, there were still some Amazonian Indians and uh, some African tribes that were still living Stone Age. 
and obesity was completely absent in those groups. So that was the observation that you know you you that pushed you to 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 start. Oh yeah. 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 There was a lack of exercise is abnormal and leads to obesity and obesity leads to diabetes and heart disease. And so and so you went to talk with Corey. No, what actually happened was that <clears throat> I didn't initiate this. There was a guy at the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. No, he was in the uh, he was in the public health service. At that time, we still had a public health service. He was in the office of the public health service, named Sam Fox. <clears throat> And uh, he was interested in exercise. You were not at that time. I was, but no, no. It wasn't my primary interest. <clears throat> and <clears throat> there was a guy at the Aging Institute. I can never remember his name. You probably know him. But there's a, one of the buildings was named after him. Mm, I remember. Anyway. Yeah. I had arranged to take, when I finished my post, my residency, I had arranged to go work with him for two years to get my service time out of the Gwen Public Health Service. And he welcomed me. He said, he's a PhD, and he said, you're going to have a fully trained MD. internist working with me. So that was my plan. And just before I was <clears throat> ready to go work with him, he called me and said, I'm sorry I have to withdraw my offer. Because to be in the public health service, you have to be a US citizen. And I didn't have my citizenship yet. Okay. So I told him, look, I'm going to get my citizenship in the next two, three weeks. He said, I'm sorry. I just Huh. Bad, bad guy for three weeks. Very strange. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so I didn't, I didn't know what I was going to do because that was up to my plan. That was your plan. And this guy in the public health service named Sam Fox had an interest in exercise. And he had found out that there was a Professor of Physical Education at Illinois University who had an exercise program for university professors. So we had this middle-aged men in a running program, doing a calisthenics and running program during the lunch hour. Uh -huh. So he called me and said, I saw your application to the public health service and it mentioned that you were interested, one of your interests was in exercise. And he told me about this program and said, would you like to be, would you like to be stationed there for two years to study the people in this exercise program? In Illinois. Huh? Where in Illinois? University of Illinois in Champaign. Oh, in Champaign, okay. Yeah. So close to Chicago. So I said, yeah, that'd be, that'd be great. And so you went there for two years? Yeah. And uh, studied these. I was really impressed with the effects. These guys were completely out of shape. I mean, they could have run half a mile when they started. And after three months, they were running, you know, four miles. So back then, you were just studying performance, fitness. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Purely clinically, you know, to see you know, people who were not able to, to run half a mile, then, you know, they were able to, yeah. after some exercise, they were able yeah. to run. So I started thinking, what, what, what makes it possible for them to improve? improve it? Yeah. 
And at that time, it was thought that uh, the increase in oxygen uptake that occurred with training was due to cardiac adaptations that increased blood flow to the muscles. So they were able to measure VO2 max back then already. Hmm? They were able to measure VO2 max. They were able to measure VO2 max since 1900. Okay. So at the end of these two years, so you didn't do any any basic science experiment up there. No. But I, I began to wonder what what is the mechanism. Yeah. And uh, if you look at the mechanism for the increase in oxygen uptake, on the average, only about half of it can be explained by increased cardiac output. And there's evidence too that there was an increase in artery venous oxygen difference. So the muscles are extracting more oxygen. I said, must there be something going on in skeletal muscle? Right. So I went to the library and started doing some literature search. And there are a lot of, a number of papers showing that there's a huge difference between tame animals and wild animals. If you look at a tame rabbit, muscles are quite white. Look at a wild rabbit, muscles are really wild. Same thing with, with ducks. Wild ducks have a huge mitochondria and myoglobin in their breasts, but much more than tame duck that don't fly. So that gave me the idea that maybe what was happening in the muscle was an increase of mitochondria, and that this increased the ADO2 difference. So the more oxygen was being extracted. And then you came to Washu. I was already at Washu. I was taking a postdoctoral fellowship at Carl Korg, studying glucose transport. What do you mean? When you after these two years of this uh, stuff, you 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 were already you came back to Washu to, as a postdoctoral fellow. So you finished these two years at Champagne, Illinois Champagne. I finished my service. Yeah, in service yeah. where you did this observation of these people improving, you know, with exercise. Yeah. Then you came back as a postdoc at Washu. Yeah. And you started to do this library research. I was just studying glucose transport already. With Carl Corey. Yeah, but once you know, I remember you told me, you know, you know, that you know, you went to uh, you went to Corey and, uh, and you asked, you asked. I said, I'd like to work with mitochondria. And he says, nobody in the department is working with mitochondria. But a lot of people work with glucose metabolism. So I, I'm interested in diabetes. So I said, I'll, I'd like to study glucose transport. So I didn't learn anything about mitochondria, but I learned how to pipe out, you know, work in the lab. Right, 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 right. <laughs> but, you know, then you told me that there was a postdoctoral fellow of him, you know, you know, he put you with a postdoctoral fellow, and then you started to do these experiments of frogs, on le le frogs, legs of frogs. Yeah, I was studying uh, glucose transport and the epitrochlorous muscle of the frog. So okay. Muscle. But the same type of glucose transport, you know, that you, know, you were doing here in your lab? Yeah. So you were it, you, you were isolating the the, the, the the muscle and doing you know the the, the, glucose, transport. the glucose transport. Then I worked with frog and then we found a muscle in right. the rat that we could use. The epitrochlearis and yeah. the, the but during my postdoctoral fellow I wrote a grant Providing the evidence that the exercise might increase mitochondria. You know, I applied for a grant to study that. But how, how did you get this idea? This hypothesis that you know mitochondria were because of this red, uh, the, the yeah. red, the, the fibers you know were more red in the in the, the difference between wild. Okay, and so that was the idea that you know sparked. Yeah. 
it was probably to do with mitochondria. Yeah. So the, the, the function of mitochondria was already known, the Krebs cycle, all this stuff. Not already, all known already. already known. So Cory had already had, you know, his, uh, his, he already had discovered uh, the Cory cycles, everything. Yeah. Yeah. The Krebs cycle was discovered before the Cory cycle. Right. Okay. And then in my office, study, study oxygen uptake by mitochondria and so on. Okay, so it, everything was already known. What it was not known is that exercise was increasing mitochondria. Yeah, exactly. And you are the first yeah. who made this observation. Yeah. In, in which year you made a classical paper? Approximately. That was a paper that made me famous. <laughs> <laughs> so that was your first major paper? No, the uh, studies I did on glucose transport were major papers. Too. But not with exercise, the glucose transport. Mm -hmm. Not with exercise, the glucose muscle transport. Contraction. Mus muscle contraction. So you basically you show you know when you when you when you contract muscle, there is an increase in glut four. In, yeah. in, no, no, at that time you didn't know about glut four. There was just an increase in glucose transport. That's it. Yeah. You stimulate the muscle and yeah. put them in a flask with glucose and measure glucose. Yeah. So the paper is the one? Number 10. Let me see. Number 10 holds the, so you're the first and only author on this paper. Yeah, I was just starting out. I made not have any post that. Right. Biochemical adaptation in muscle. Effect of exercise on mitochondrial O2 uptake, oxygen uptake, and respiratory enzyme activity in skeletal muscle. So in this paper, you measure the mitochondria, the, 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 the activity, you know, the, the enzymes of the mitochondria. Both activity and total oxygen. Okay. Let me see if, if we were able to record here. <laughs> okay, this is the, the end uh, of... Uh, the first part of the registration. I should have a second one. Very interesting, isn't it? So basically this kind of story of John, you know, how he started his career. It's, uh, it's uh, very nice memories of my, again, my very close friend. You know, I was so happy, you know, that, you know, I could go and see him, uh, you know, at least once a week, you know, I was trying to go and, uh, and visit him, you know, in the last, uh, the last couple of years when I was in St. Louis. Such a nice guy, such a great man. Uh, people, uh, many people, they know in the exercise physiology, they know, you know, he's one of the major exercise physiologists of the, uh, you know, in the last decades. And many uh, post, famous postdoc trained with him and uh, he has a huge legacy. And, but it's not only as a scientist, you know, but also as a man, you know, he, he was a very nice uh, man, you know, with a big heart. He has his ideas, of course, but, you know, he was really a great man. You know, I learned a lot from him, you know, about thinking about, you know, writing papers and uh, writing grants. And, you know, we had, I had the privilege, you know, to spend, you know, a lot of time with him, you know, every, every day I was going at least once or twice in his office and we were discussing about everything, about politics, about philosophy, about science, about experiments, uh, and, you know, and I was so fortunate. Anyway, this is the end of part one. I should have a second part that I'm going to upload. Uh, good.